Good morning and welcome back to Planet Doug Behind the Scenes for March 9th, 2024. And I'm not really supposed to be sitting here enjoying coffee and talking on camera. I had vague plans to go to a local event. There's a rocky peninsula here, a park called Cape Rachado. And I found out just yesterday, I guess, someone left a comment on one of my videos saying that the annual um, raptor migration watch event is taking place at Cape Rochado this weekend. So Saturday and Sunday, today being Saturday, there is some sort of an event going on at Cape Rochado, at the lighthouse in fact, where bird watching groups and bird watching societies put up booths and they're going to have a VIP there and I guess there are going to be nature walks and it's all dedicated to learning about the raptors that use Cape Rochado as a resting point during their migrations north or south. So I thought that might be uh, interesting, but in the end I decided not to go. And to be honest, that was partially because of YouTube. Um, yeah, it's this weird time balance thing that I've been dealing with lately more and more in that I would enjoy going there. I would enjoy shooting the video and the video would be interesting enough, but would I enjoy it enough and would the video be interesting enough to justify the two days of video editing that would follow? that is something that has become a real problem for me mentally there's a psychological anchor around my neck these days where you have the urge to film something to go out and have an experience and take video of that experience but then you realize if you're being realistic well okay you can go have lunch at this local restaurant and take video of it but do you want to spend all of tomorrow editing that video, is it worth the effort? And something like going to this bird watching event would require, the way I shoot videos anyway, a lot of research before I go there. I'd want to do a lot of reading about raptors and mig migration patterns, learn about what kind of raptors we're talking about. Are these hawks, uh, eagles, what exactly? So there's a lot of information I'd want to pack into my brain before I go there. And then I've got to get there and it's 15 kilometers away and then shooting video all day is a major effort and then there would be at least two days of editing to package that video and upload it probably more than two days and in the end to be honest when I woke up this morning my vague plans to go turned into oh, I can't face it I just I can't do it I can't do the two days of editing for that video the event isn't big enough to justify that much work. So I ended up not going. Even though I would have enjoyed it, now it was YouTube preventing me from doing something I would enjoy. So that, yeah, that's not a good sign. And I must admit that there is a little bit of a feeling of not wanting to be a bird watcher. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in pop culture, in books I've read, and in real life, bird watchers tend to be a certain type of person. And I feel like in order to become a true bird watcher, I have to be another 10 years older. When you turn 70, you're allowed to put on the whole bird watching gear, get the giant camera with the giant lens, get the huge binoculars, and then you go out bird watching. That is something, in my mind, somebody in their 70s will do. And these people who are bird watchers, at least in pop culture, they're portrayed as quite eccentric characters. And I don't think I've reached quite that level of age and eccentricity to justify going to a bird watching event. Not quite yet. <laughs> anyway, apologies to anyone out there that is a bird watcher. I, I see the appeal. My father, in fact, was a major bird watcher in the later stages of his life. And he's a little bit like me. I think I have one of his 
characteristics in that when he does something, he does tend to go all in. He, he doesn't do half, half measures. So when he decided to become a bird watcher, he founded his own bird watching club, had members, had meetings, and he set up a separate phone line in our house with an answering machine. This was all pre-digital, pre-internet days, of course. And we had an actual answering machine with a cassette tape. And it was a hotline for bird watchers. So any bird watcher who would see a rare bird somewhere, or any bird really, would call into the hotline and leave a message about what bird they saw and where they saw it all the details and then other bird watchers would listen to this message and then they would go all go rushing out there in order to see this bird and they all had birding lists you have your annual list all the birds you see that year you tick them off the list and then you have a lifetime achievement list where you get to tick off all the birds you've seen in your lifetime and it becomes a big to do it's it's a big thing to suddenly become a bird watcher and I guess I'm not quite ready to become a, a bird watcher just yet. And instead of bird watching, I spent the morning up until now, it's about 10 o'clock in the morning now, I woke up quite early, and I've been on my computer the entire morning and I've been replying to comments. In the last couple of hours, they were comments to my behind the scenes videos. I haven't been on top of those as much lately. So I fired up behind the scenes on YouTube Studio and I was reply reading all the comments and then replying to those that um, I had something to say in reply to that person. And that's always an interesting experience. Um, there was one thing I was talking about in, in a previous video was a problem with uploading videos through YouTube Studio. And when I upload a video through YouTube Studio on my phone, I'm doing that because my laptop, I don't want to keep it running for a lot of hours during the night. So I've decided to give my laptop a rest and upload from my phone. And that works out very well because I, I can't keep my laptop running for that many hours. It starts to wear out. So I did that. But I ran into a problem where on, on YouTube Studio, there's no progress indicator so that when I'm uploading the video, it just sits there and I have no idea what's going on. I don't know whether it started the upload. Have we reached 10%, 20%? There's nothing to show that anything is happening. And that's a little bit of an annoyance. So I talked about that. And then I got a few comments too, I guess from people who said, no, 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 you can see the progress on that circle with the arrow, I guess. It just shows you the progress. And everyone was giving me helpful hints about, no, no, you can see the progress. Just go there and there it is. But of course, all those people leaving comments, they don't live on planet Doug. They live in a sensible world where things make sense and where technology works because when they look at YouTube Studio, they actually see an upload progress circle, I guess, inside this arrow. They see it, but I don't. It works for them, but I'm here to tell you it does not work for me. <laughs> so yeah, people told me, no, 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 it's there, it's there, but I'm looking at mine and no, it isn't. On your phone, I believe you, it is there. On my phone, it is not there. And I, I get messages like that all the time when it comes to technology. And I, I believe everyone who tells me, hey, this works perfectly. And I believe you that for you, it works perfectly. <laughs> but you don't, live in, you don't live on Planet Doug. Um, Planet Doug seems to have a population of one very uh, stressed out human being sitting here in my typical red shirt. And in my world, on planet Doug, things don't work. They just don't. And I can never tell you why it will work for you, but nine times out of ten, it won't, uh, it won't work for me. So, yeah, there's definitely no uploading progress. Though someone did tell me I can see it in a notifications 
window. I guess on the phone itself, you swipe down and then you see in the notifications, it will tell you the progress of the upload. I haven't had a chance to test that yet. But somehow I don't believe that because that's outside of YouTube Studio. How could my Android phone know what I'm doing from YouTube and how much progress has been made in the upload? Maybe it's there, but I'm going to do a test later on and see because that would help me out a lot. So basically what I end up doing is I start the upload on my phone and then I just before I go to bed at night, I start that process and I put the phone aside and I just leave the phone there the entire night. And then when I wake up in the morning, I grab a different phone and I go to YouTube Studio and then I can go to the contents and see, oh, the video has uploaded. But on the original phone, the where, where I'm doing the actual uploading, it's still just sitting at the first screen. All I get is an arrow and an empty circle. And there's no indication of what's going on. And I don't want to refresh that window because I'm worried about canceling the upload, screwing it up somehow. So I have to start the upload here. I get no information and then I can go to a second phone. And when the video is finished uploading, oh, I can see. And then I can go back to the original phone and then go to a different window, refresh it, and then it, sh it shows it uploaded. Though I never get a message that says upload complete or we are now processing your video, we are now checking your video. None of that information ever shows up for me on Planet Doug. <laughs> on other people's planets, I'm sure it all works fine, but uh, not, not, on a, not on my planet. And I guess in general, there are quite a few comments that fall into that category. Very well-meaning, kind people out there. Thank you very much for being so well-meaning and kind and giving me advice and tips to how to solve all the problems that I end up facing in my life. It seems like 90% of these behind the scenes videos lately are just struggles with the modern world and other people seem to be able to sail through these situations without any kind of mishap. Certainly not the mishaps that I end up facing. Um, for example, I will talk about a hotel where I'm staying, issues with it, things like that, and people will say that there are much better options all around and that of course is true but those better options that I've been able to find, they all cost two or three times more. So a lot of the problems that I might face in terms of accommodation, that comes with a certain budget. And once you're stuck at that budget level, that's just how life is. That's how things work there. And um, I expect that. There was an interesting comment this morning where someone said, why, why did you stay at that place? I can't, to be honest, I can't even remember what I said about that place. This was SPD Backpackers. I stayed there when I went to uh, Cape Rochado, where the bird watching event is taking place. And I actually, I liked it there. It's very suitable for me in that I don't mind having a small room with a single bed, no furniture, and no private bathroom. That's fine for me. Um, I'm used to that. The problem in Malaysia is that those sorts of places are very rare and they don't come with an appropriate price. Even though you're in a small room with no private bathroom, a single bed, it's very sparse. The price is still the same as a one-star low-budget hotel. So you don't really... The price does not change depending on the uh, the level of the accommodation and that is a problem for me but overall the conditions there i was perfectly happy with it there were some issues with my neighbors i talked about that in my extended cut to my caper chato video if you jump ahead there's a section in the extended cut that says hostile life and i talk about all the people that you do tend to find in low budget accommodation 
the people who slam doors, the people who burp, who belch all the time, who close the bathroom door behind them even when they're not in there anymore, the people who make lots of noise in the hallway, and the fact that the, the walls are so thin you hear everybody and everything. I did talk about that, and that is, that is a problem with low-budget life. You're ending up living in a, with low-budget people, and they may not always be the quietest people that you could uh, hope for. And they do tend to be jamming as many people into a room as they can fit, which means that their life spills, out, spills over into the hallway, and they end up having these long, drawn-out conversations because they just leave the door to their room open because they have too many people in the room. If they close the door, it feels too confining. So what they do is leave the door open and then people hang out in the hallway and they basically take over the whole area and the conversation just pours into all the neighboring rooms. But on the positive side, that also makes life interesting. You have things to talk about. You haven't just spent the night in the Hilton Hotel or the Ramada where everything was perfect and then you have nothing to talk about. Staying in a low-budget hostel at least gets you, you know, uh, oops, I'm trying so hard not to say, you know. Um, yeah, you end up rubbing shoulders with the world in general and, and you end up having stories to tell because of that. So I don't really mind. But what this person was saying is that on Google Maps, SPD Backpackers has a star rating of 2.7. Like, why would you stay at a place that has a rating of 2.7? You know it's going to be bad. But to be honest, I don't really know that because when you get a Google Maps rating, you get people from all walks of life. And everybody who stays at SPD Backpackers has a different perspective. So someone might go there who is accustomed to nicer hotels and they saw this place at a good price and they booked a room there and their expectations were too high. So they give it a very low rating. They'll say, oh, there was this problem and there was this problem and there was this problem. When I stay at a low budget place, I expect those problems to be there. I'm not surprised by them. They fit my expectations. So these people who have high expectations, you have to take their review with a grain of salt. And a lot of people will have problems with things that I don't have problems with. People will leave a comment that when they went into the bathroom, there was hair in the sink, uh, one star. And for me, I don't care. I expect there to be hair in the sink. I expect there to be cockroaches in the sink. These are things that don't bother me. So if I see a review, a one-star review, and they base it on the bathroom not being quite as spotless as they hoped, I don't really take their review into account. So I read between the lines is what I'm saying. I'll look for a review that sounds like it's coming from somebody who lives in my world and then a backpacker type of person. And they will say, as long as you know what you're getting yourself into, this place is perfectly fine. And then they, taught, they describe it. It's like this and this and this and this, but they're saying, that's what you expect at this price range. And there was nothing terrible about the place. So I, I read all the reviews and I, judge them based on, I put them in context is what I'm saying. So if a place has a one star review, that doesn't really mean it's a terrible place. It could be perfectly acceptable. It could be perfect for me. You just don't know. So anyway, I, uh, I didn't even know the place. I don't think I even knew it had such a low star rating. Maybe I knew that, I'm not sure, but anyway. I was, I was okay there. I would go back there, but I would be unhappy because of the price. I would feel like I'm being taken advantage of. I'm paying the same price as a room that comes with 
a private bathroom and these things. But now this place, the room is much more Spartan, but they haven't lowered the price to match. And then I feel like a bit of a dummy that I'm being taken advantage of from that point of view. But in terms of the living conditions, yeah, perfectly fine with a place like that. One funny thing about low budget accommodation or almost anything I do in life, it, I have to train the people around me to get used to me and my habits. And then I become much happier. So here I'm in a different hotel in Port Dixon and I've been here for a few days now. <laughs> and life has actually gotten much better over time because the people that work here are learning about me and my habits. So for the first couple of days, I was, they were kind of driving me crazy because I booked the room for two nights, I think, and then I rebooked the room. Well, let's step back. I booked the room for two nights, and then on the first morning, I'm sitting here in my room, and I've got my laptop on my lap. I've got a, a hard drive plugged into it from the side. I've got the power cord, and everything is sort of delicately balanced here. And then there comes knock, 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 knock on the door. Knock, 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 knock. And I'm like, oh. <sighs> so I have to, you know, very care. I have to pick up my laptop, pick up everything, move it to the side very carefully, get out of bed, and getting out of this bed is very difficult. I usually have a cup of coffee sitting here on the mattress, so I've got to somehow pick it up, move it over here. There's a little spot here where I can put it down safely, and then I get to the door and open. I have to put on a shirt because I'm usually not sitting here with a shirt on. I may not be dressed at all. So I have to put on clothes, I open the door, and there's someone standing there trying to be nice to me and give me good service, and they want house, housekeeping? Do you want us to clean the room? I'm like, no, that's okay, you don't need to clean the room, thank you very much, thank you, thank you, I'm okay. And I explain to them, I'll, I'll even show them the bed and say, look at all of that electronics. Um, it's a lot of trouble to change the sheets. So we don't need to worry about that for now. I'll let you know if I ever need new sheets. So thank you very much. I close the door, I get back in, I laptop, coffee, I'm all settled in, I'm working. I might have earplugs in. Knock, 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 knock on the door again. I'm like, oh, come on. I gotta go through that whole circus all over again, get out of bed, put clothes back on, and I'm shouting, just a minute, just a minute. And I go to the door, I open the door, and they say, towels? Would you like new towels? And again, like, no, I, I don't need new towels. This is a technically a double room, so even from the beginning, I have two towels to work with. So after one night, I don't need a new towel. And generally, I can make one towel last for a very, very, very long time. So I almost, I never need new towels ever. So we had to go through all that on the first day. And then I wanted to stay longer, so I booked the room again online, got the confirmation, paid for it. I sent the confirmation to the hotel's WhatsApp number to let them know that I'm staying longer and I would like to stay in the same room, et cetera, et cetera. So then I'm here, and of course, at noon, knock, 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 knock on the door, and I open the door and there's the, the people are out there saying, you gotta go, it's time to check out, check out, it's check out time. And, and then I have to explain to them, I, I rebooked the room for another two or three nights and I sent the confirmation, everything's cool, I've already paid, I'm not, I'm not checking out today. And then we have to have this long discussion, they have to see the documents, they have to contact the hotel owners and, so I have to deal with all of that. They finally go away. I sit back down, knock, 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 knock. Would you like us to clean the room? Like, no, 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 no. You don't have to clean the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I close the door, get settled in, knock, knock, knock. Would you like new towels? No, I don't need new towels. Everything's fine. I'm, I'm self-sufficient. You don't have to do anything for me. Just 
leave me alone to do my thing. Close the door, get back into bed, get on the computer. Everything's all set. I'm busy editing video. Knock, 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 knock. I open the door and they say, oh, since you are staying longer, would you like to change rooms? Because apparently this is the worst room in the whole place. And that's also another ongoing feature of Planet Doug. Wherever I go, I always get the worst hotel room and the worst table in the restaurant. It just always happens. And apparently, because of the way I booked my room and the way they assign the rooms, I got the last one available, and it is the smallest, least comfortable of all the rooms. And they were trying to be nice to me, and they said, here, let me show you a much better room. And they showed me one across the hall, which is quite a bit bigger, and it actually has space on one side of the bed between the bed and the bathroom so it would be more comfortable to be there and they're trying to do a nice thing for me but of course i'm settled into this room and it doesn't really bother me that it is a small room i've become accustomed to it and all of my electronics and my chargers and my extension cord everything is plugged in i have the whole room arranged to be suitable for me. To be honest, now that a couple of days have passed, I wish I had moved to a different room. It would have been worth the effort of moving. But at that moment, I'd already answered the door so many times and I was just, I was in the middle of so many things. I just didn't want the hassle at that moment of packing up and moving to a new room. So I just said, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm fine in this room though, um, yeah. Thinking back, <laughs> I probably would have benefited from moving, but you just don't know either. There is the expression, which I find is very applicable to life in general, talking about the devil you know, that okay, they're showing me a room that is bigger, but who knows what problems that room could introduce. Here in this room, there are problems, but I know what those problems are and the things that are important to me actually work. So the water flows, the water drains, the air conditioner works, it's quiet in here, the Wi-Fi works. So the basics are covered and that room, I don't know. For all I know, it could be noisy over there. Maybe the Wi-Fi signal doesn't reach into that room. Maybe the air conditioner is an older model that doesn't work as well. Or who knows? This is the devil that I know, this room. And I'm content here. And changing to a different room could improve my life in some ways. But who knows? It could be much worse in others that you can't anticipate. So, yeah, the devil you know is a very useful expression to think about sometimes. affairs story, I came across something quite interesting this morning. It was an article on CNN called Photographer Steps Inside Vietnam's Shadowy Click Farms. And I found the story interesting because I love these glimpses into unknown worlds. You hear about these things and you imagine that they exist but you really don't know what they look like or even whether they really do exist. And when you come across a story like this, it's quite interesting. I remember long ago watching, I think it was a Vice video about scam centers in Nigeria. The people that send out the emails trying to trick people, the whole Nigerian prince needing your help to transfer $50 million outside of the country, all these sorts of things. Someone went there to investigate it and found a bunch of people that work in these scam centers in Nigeria and showed the insides of them and talked to the people and got a lot of facts and figures about how they actually work. And I find that quite uh, fascinating. 
and you do see a lot of the videos now on YouTube. It's a whole genre. If you're not aware of it, they're sort of interesting to check out what they call the um, scam baiters. And these are people who have a lot of computer skills and they deliberately contact a scam center, mainly in India, of course. And then they have the technology, they have the computer skills to turn the tables on them. So on the scam call center in India, what they're trying to do is get control of your computer. So the main way they do that is they convince you to download this software. And when you download the software and you give them access to it, it allows them to control your computer from their computer. And of course, once they have that control, they can do anything they want. But what scam baiters do is pretend to go along with them and they do, they do one of two things. One thing they do is just make fun of them. They pretend to be following their instructions. They often have um, voice generators, so they aren't using their own voice. They're pretending to be a 70-year-old man or an 80-year-old woman and pretending to be doing what they're told and yet they keep making mistakes and they just draw out the conversation as long as they can hoping just to frustrate the scammer and waste their time and they can they can be amusing to uh, sit through those videos but they also have technical skills where where the scammer is trying to get control of your computer they flip it on them and somehow end up in control of the scammer's computer. And then they get access to their computers and they can even get access to their webcams inside the office and can actually see them, what they're doing and learn their names and learn things about them. And of course, the most famous of these people end up getting enough information that they contact the police and they try to get the police to raid these places and these are all scam baiters and i do find those videos interesting because you get to see inside that world what it really looks like and this article from vietnam was all about click farms and i'd heard about click farms it makes sense that they exist because the currency of modern social media is clicks and likes and engagement and it feels like if you know what you're doing with computers and smartphones you can fake a lot of that so you could offer your services to companies who want to make it look like their brand is extremely popular and they'll hire a company in vietnam and buy likes from them and according to the article it's like one penny per like so you can say to them, I'd like to buy 10,000 likes. And then these people will take your money and then they go onto their computer and make sure that your YouTube video, your Instagram post suddenly has 10,000 likes that appear to be coming from all over the world. And then of course they have bots that are leaving comments, supporting one political candidate versus another. Everything is fake and everything is bought and paid for. And this is all coming from click farms. And this photographer, I guess he went to Vietnam, gained access to click farms, and then went in there and took pictures of all of them. And then he, I guess, published a book containing all the photos of, the, of this world and how it looks. And I find that, uh, that kind of interesting because I, I live these days on the borders of the world of uh, social media and uh, anything that shows click farms and scammers, how all of that works, I find uh, quite interesting. In this story, I debated whether to talk about it or not because it is such an awful story. Even thinking about it makes me feel ill, makes me feel sick to my stomach just thinking about it. So it isn't pleasant, but it is something that just happened in India and it relates to a lot of the things that I do and that I'm talking about 
in these behind the scenes video. So the story is that a Spanish Brazilian couple, they're, I don't think they're YouTubers per se, they're more like Instagrammers, but they are traveling around the world on a motorcycle. They've been to a hundred plus countries already, traveling hundreds of thousands of kilometers. They're basically doing the itchy boots thing. They're traveling around the world on a motorcycle and they're documenting their experiences and they are doing it in a very adventurous way where they have camping equipment and they're going to remote places and pushing the boundaries. They're not, they're not out there doing pure tourism. It's more, a little bit more like adventure tourism on the lines of itchy boots and traveling on a big fancy motorcycle with camera gear and documenting everything and posting everything to Instagram. And a few days ago, maybe a week ago, they were camping out in India and then seven men, Indian men, came at night, attacked them and they gang raped the woman and beat them badly. And of course they held the man, I believe it's her husband, if not her husband, her long-term boyfriend, the two of them are traveling together. So they gang raped, gang -raped the woman and then they held a knife to the throat of the man to hold him helpless. And I guess the whole episode lasted for two, two hours or more. And they ended up going to the hospital, of course, and to the police reported what happened. And since then, the only news I've seen is that three of the men have been arrested and four of them are, they're still looking for them but apparently the police have all their names. The three that they arrested already confessed. So there really is no question of what they did and who did it. The three confessed and they gave the names of the four other men that were involved. So this is a big, big story that's going around social media and going around the world on media in general. Of course, there are a whole bunch of ways of approaching a story like this and thinking about it. It's not pleasant to think about, as I said, I, I sort of feel ill if I do stop and think about it. And it, to someone like me, I think to any normal person, it's incomprehensible. I don't understand how anything like this ever happens. Why would these seven men do this. I don't get it. It seems so bizarre to me, so far out there that I can't even think of them as being human in the same way that I'm human. It's, I mean, that's one way to approach the story. And it makes me feel very strange because they, they are human. These seven men are men and men in India, and they did do this thing, and they wanted to do it, and they did it. So you have to accept that this behavior was, is within the range of human behavior, and it makes me feel weird about my day-to-day -day life because I go out into the world every single day, and I interact with people all the time, and everybody is nice, and everybody is friendly, and everybody is kind and generous, and this is my understanding of what people are like and it becomes very confusing for me to sort of imagine that men like this actually exist and thought that this was a acceptable thing to do it just it screws with my perceptions of what it means to be human if that makes any sense it doesn't make any sense to me at all so that's the very first reaction. But then you get into some of the details and even that just confuses me. And I do find media stories in general to be frustrating because I'm so focused on details and you only ever get the most basic information. And so much of it is puzzling when you watch it. So I read as many articles as I could find about this story there are videos about it, people talking about it. The couple themselves, they actually posted a video to Instagram right after it happened. 
the, the same night they were at the hospital and they recorded a video, obviously very distraught, and they put that video on their Instagram feed and that's how the world learned about it. But then once the police started investigating officially, the police asked them to remove the video because it could interfere with their investigation. So they, they complied with what the police asked them to do and they took down the video so it's not there anymore. But I think you can you see clips of it all over the place in the uh, media stories. And of course another way to think about the story is from the point of view of other people who are traveling around the world by bicycle or motorcycle and of course the first person I think of is Nora Lee from Itchy Boots and I've noticed in her Africa videos in particular she makes a concerted effort to get from A to B. She's not riding her motorcycle at random and just pitching her tent in the middle of nowhere wherever the sun goes down. And that makes perfect sense that she would do that just for personal security. So in her videos you notice that she starts from a gated hotel and as she leaves the hotel in the morning, there's always someone at the front, a security guard who opens the gate for her. She drives out and she rides her motorcycle all day. And at the end of the day, she always makes sure to arrive at another hotel with a gated entrance and a security guard opens the gate. She rides in, closes behind her, and that is how she's traveling. And it makes perfect sense because she's by herself for one thing, this couple in India, it was a man and a woman together, but because it was seven men who attacked them, it ended up making no difference that she had a male companion. Um, it didn't help at all in this case. But Itchy Boots is traveling on her own, so obviously she's going to try to get to one of these secure hotels, and that is part of the structure of her journey, and it uh, makes sense. And I have to admit, it does make me think about India because you hear these stories from India, it seems, all the time. Maybe if you look at the actual statistics, perhaps crime in India is no more uh, significant than in other countries. Perhaps if you dive into the statistics, foreign visitors are robbed or killed or raped in other countries just as often as it happens in India. <clears throat> that could be true and yet the stories seem to always come out of India. I've, I've, I've heard many of them over the past few years. There was a cyclist, not a motorcyclist, but someone traveling, a woman on her own I believe, traveling on a bicycle, camping out, and then she was also attacked and gang raped at night. I forget the details of her story. And of course you hear lots of stories of women born in India, Indian women being raped in India. There seems to be a significant problem there with this. And it makes me feel different about India to the point that, to be honest, after all of these stories, I would never go to India. I really wouldn't go there anymore. And that may or may not be a fair. You can't judge a country based on one story you read in the news, but I've read so many of them. And then even people that travel through India and nothing terrible happens to them. It's very rare to have someone, an adventure style traveler, come out of India talking about how wonderful it was. It's always, <laughs> tough and difficult and it can be really interesting but also really tough and unpleasant much of the time and they end up with a lot of stories to tell but luckily for me I've been to India I went to India back in 1982 and I was there for a few months as part of a cultural exchange program living in a village living with a farming family with a group made up of young canadians and young people from india so i've probably had the best experience you can have in india already i've been there my experience in india was a very positive one 
and it had a big impact on my life. So I don't really need to go to India. And at this point, I, I don't think I would just because of all the stories that keep coming out of there. And if I were a woman on a bike tour or motorcycle tour, no, I definitely wouldn't go to India based on these stories. And that may be fair or unfair to the country of India, but um, that's certainly the impression you get from the media that uh, it's risky to go there as, as a woman to go to India, whether you have a male companion or not, I, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, not these days. And speaking of women going around the world on a motorcycle on adventure tours, a new Itchy Boots video. This one is called They Blew Up the Bridges in the Angolan Civil War. And for the, um, the trip itself, the, the day of riding her motorcycle. I don't think I have a lot to talk about. As she points out in the title to the video, she crossed a lot of rickety bridges. In the whole video, I don't think she ever mentioned the Civil War or why the bridges are so rickety. I don't think that ever came up. To be honest, I was only half paying attention. I had the video playing on a smartphone while I was doing something else on my computer and I was going back and forth. So I, maybe I missed the section where she talked about the Civil War, but I don't think she ever mentioned it. I think she just rode her motorcycle as she normally does. And then she crossed these bridges that were made up of just pieces of wood and tree branches and tree trunks that were laid down on these cross beams and when you look at those bridges you had to stop and think okay this is risky especially for a big heavy motorcycle like hers you had to wonder can this bridge support the weight of her motorcycle and even if the bridge as a whole can these individual pieces of wood are loose they're not nailed down and you could easily see her getting the front wheel twisted, falling through the cracks and then falling over and the whole motorcycle going off the bridge. It was a, she had to stop at every bridge and kind of look at it and make a judgment call. And when I was watching the video, to be honest, I did have the feeling that if I were in her shoes on one or two of those bridges, I would have unloaded the motorcycle before I tried it. Because I'd done that with my bicycle in the past. I rode my bike through Guinea and Ethiopia in Africa, and there were times, especially in Guinea, I remember in the countryside, there were bridges I had to go across that were pretty interesting. And then I would take all the pannier bags off the bike, get all the weight off the bike and roll the bike across and then carry the bags and put them back on. And then with her motorcycle, I might have taken the time to do the same thing, remove everything of value, even take most of the cameras off, just in case the motorcycle goes over the side and then get the motorbike across and go back and get the bags. It's a hassle, it takes a long time, but the alternative, can you imagine? She already had her motorcycle flip out of a canoe once and go underwater and that caused a lot of trouble but even then I don't her bags weren't attached to the motorcycle but imagine if everything was mounted on the motorbike and it went over the side into the river that would be a big problem but she made it across and um, on one bridge I noticed I appreciate all these little details and videos a man pushed her motorbike from behind because there were parts where her front wheel would go into a dip, a trough between two pieces of wood, and it's hard to get the motorcycle moving again. And then the guy saw her struggling and then he went behind and helped push. And when they got to the other side of the bridge, she stopped and handed him some money. Thank you very much for helping me out. Gave him a tip, essentially. And me being me with my uh, planet dug brain, I'm always wondering about these behind the scenes details especially when it comes to a YouTube video or an Instagram reel, something like that, because you do see people 
interacting with local people all the time on videos where they give them something or help them in some way and then the YouTuber moves on and then someone will inevitably leave a comment why are you being so cheap why didn't you give them a tip why didn't you pay them something and then the YouTuber always replies I did give them a tip I did give them some money I just didn't keep it in the video and you get you see that interaction over and over so I think someone like Itchy Boots, when she's editing the video, she's probably making a decision at every point. She's editing the video. Oh, here's the section where I gave the guy some money. And you can't win sometimes. If you give someone money, people will criticize you for doing that. And then if you don't give them money, you'll get criticized for that. There will always be, <laughs> for a big YouTuber, there's going to be a comment taking one side or the other. So eventually you just have to ignore that input and just do whatever you want to do naturally. But I can see her editing the video and looking at that and thinking just as I did, hmm, if I don't show me giving this guy money, people are gonna ask and people are gonna wonder, did you give him any money? So ah, for this time, let's, let's leave it in. And of course, I wanna know how much. I always take it to the next level. I'm very glad that she showed that she gave the guy a tip because for me that's part of the overall day. Her video will show what her day was like and then you make a judgment call, oh that was a great day or that was this kind of day or that kind of day. But then maybe if you include in that day all the times she had to get money out and, and give money to all these people for all these services and things that they helped her out with that might change the flavor of the day change the character of the whole experience if you know what i mean and i want to know how much but again that's just my brain she gave him money okay but how much money was that and how did she decide how much is enough how much is too much, how much is too little. You don't want to give too little because that, that's just embarrassing. But you also don't want to wander around handing out buckets of cash to everyone you meet. That is weird too, but in a different way. And it can perpetuate this stereotype that every foreign visitor is a millionaire and dripping with money, which is usually not, uh, not the case. There were some technology notes about her latest video. The most interesting is as soon as the video started, I noticed that her navigational tablet was turned around. You couldn't see the screen. And I thought that was kind of weird. I didn't even know it could swivel, but it turns out it can't swivel. It turned out that it wasn't working. And rather than just be looking at this annoying screen that's not working. She just turned the whole thing around and she had the rear of it facing her. And she made a very interesting comment that it was an ironic situation because she said she normally never talks about her technology or her gear for a long time because she wants to make absolutely sure that it is high quality and she can recommend it. So she really wanted to put her tablet through its paces, use it for months, and then if she really approves of it, then she'll talk about it and give the brand name. And then she can sort of put her name behind it and, and recommend it to people. So just recently, like one video ago, two videos ago, I think, for the first time, she actually talked about the tablet and she gave us the name of it and talked about the company. And I talked about that in my previous uh, BTS video and I put the website in my video as well. And I was thinking, ah, finally, I was so curious about what kind of tablet that was and where she got it from. I couldn't figure it out, but I guess she'd used it long enough and liked it enough that she finally felt comfortable talking about it and recommending it. And as soon as she did that, it broke down and it stopped working. She was like, ah, for Pete's sake, you know, I just could, I just concluded that I can recommend this thing. But then she did leave a little note at the top of the screen saying later in the day, it started to work again. So it wasn't completely unusable. 
just in the morning, for whatever reason, there was a glitch and it wouldn't load the proper screen and she couldn't get it working. But later in the day, it started to work again. So I, th I thought that was kind of interesting. And Planet Doug, a uh, note of approval, she used the word spoiler correctly. And this is another uh, Planet Doug pet peeve of mine. Uh, as I've talked about with uh, other people, I love precision in language. I prefer to use the correct words and use the appropriate words. And people use spoiler alert wrong all the time. What they will do is say spoiler alert and then give the spoiler right away. If they're talking about a movie where the main character dies in the end, they'll say spoiler alert, she dies. But that's not a spoiler alert. That is the spoiler. A spoiler alert would be to alert somebody that a spoiler is coming. Spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you about the plot of the movie. So if you don't want to know anything about the movie, stop listening, turn off the video or jump ahead. Spoiler alert, that is a spoiler alert. If you just say, spoiler alert, she dies in the end. That's not a spoiler alert. You haven't alerted anybody. You just spoiled the movie. You gave the spoiler. So it's a, it's a simple, silly little thing. But every time somebody says in a video, spoiler alert, and then gives the spoiler, it bothers me um, because it isn't a spoiler alert. But Itchy Boots in her video, she's talking about this tablet about how it's not working and then on the screen she put spoiler colon it started working again in the afternoon so she just said spoiler and then gave the spoiler and that is so perfect it's perfect english it's very correct and proper and i approved of that very much had she said spoiler alert the tablet that would not be correct she gave a spoiler not a spoiler alert. Planet Doug approved. Planet Doug unapproved is that I noticed that her Insta360 Ace Pro camera kept getting knocked out of alignment. I've been noticing this for a long time. I don't know if it happened as much with her GoPros, but I think it did. But it's happening a lot with her Ace Pro. She's riding the motorcycle, going over a bump, and then I can see the camera swivel it now it's pointing down or it's pointing up into the sky and then she has to take her hand off the handlebars and then move the camera to point it at her again and then she goes over the next bump and whoop, the camera tilts and then she has to adjust it put it back in position i've been seeing that quite a bit so i was wondering why she doesn't tighten that up there's a thumb screw there the ace pro has a magnetic quick release so she should be able to tighten up that thumb screw as much as she wants and she can still remove the camera easily because of the magnetic mounting system and for that kind of thumb screw you can buy a special wrench a little plastic wrench because sometimes you can't tighten up a thumb screw enough you don't have enough finger power you don't have the leverage to do it so from a like gopro sells this thing. I, I have one, of course, in my uh, kit bag, and it's a little plastic wrench, and it give, you can put it over top of the uh, thumb screw, and it gives you leverage, just like a, a, someone working on a car engine, a big wrench to tighten the bolt. You pay, take this little plastic wrench, and you can really tighten down that thumb screw, and then the camera's not going to get knocked out of alignment anymore. So, yeah, I noticed that <laughs> every time the camera went boop. And she would put it back into position, then boop, put it back into position. And uh, yeah, who knows? It was just maybe it was just a, a recent thing, and she just hadn't gotten around to uh, tightening that down properly yet. Or maybe for this particular camera and its mounting system, it doesn't work, but I don't think so. I think that thumb screw would work on an Ace Pro just as well as it works on a GoPro. Because if, you, if I tighten down one of my GoPros with that wrench on a thumb screw, it's not moving. 
you can go over as big a bump as you want on a motorcycle and, and the camera is going to stay rock steady. It's not, uh, it's not going to move. So yeah, you can tighten it enough if you want to. Anyway, this YouTube story is an unusual one because it is about a YouTuber who didn't post a video. There's no new video. And there hasn't been one for months and months and months and months. And that is the story. A long time ago, I talked at length about a guy from Lebanon called, his name is Rob, Roberto Helu. And I believe that's the name of his YouTube channel as well. Just Rob, Roberto Helu. And he set off on a bicycle journey from Cape Town, from Cairo to Cape Town. He was going to ride his bicycle across or down all of Africa, and he was going to document it on YouTube. And I talked about him at length for many, many reasons. And then he went to Egypt and just got into the Sudan, and he posted videos about those places and then he disappeared um, the last i heard from him he couldn't cross the border into the sudan because of the fighting the border was closed so he had to fly into probably addis ababa in ethiopia he was going to fly into ethiopia and then nothing radio silence I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the next video and I don't know how many months it's been. It's been a long, long time. Four months, six months, eight months. I don't know. It's been a long time and he hasn't posted another video. So I thought maybe the guy gave up. I don't know what happened to him because his videos were incredibly elaborate. He doesn't shoot the standard YouTube travel vlog. He doesn't shoot post. He does an entire feature length film or documentary with so much editing, so much processing and graphics that it takes a long time to do them. So when a month went by and there was no new video, I thought, well, he just doesn't have the time. And how do you post videos from Ethiopia? Maybe there's no internet. I waited two months, three months, four months however long it's been, but still no video. So I thought maybe he just decided it's too much work to make vi YouTube videos. He didn't realize how much time it would take and he just uh, gave up. And he was cycling with a partner. He had a, a friend of his with, with, was with him and she was also a YouTuber and she did the same thing. Her last video was from the Sudan just before they flew to Ethiopia and then nothing. Not a single video from her since then. But then I was thinking about this guy the other day and I went to his YouTube channel just to check, like, has there been a new video yet? And there hadn't been. But then I noticed when I did some reading on his YouTube channel, maybe I was reading comments. I think I was reading comments. That was, that was what it was. Because a lot of people were leaving comments asking him, where are you? Are you okay? Um, what happened? You went to Ethiopia, but why aren't you posting any new videos? And then there was talk about Instagram. And I thought, I always forget about that. I always forget that there are other social media outlets that maybe he's not posting videos, but maybe he's posting photos to Instagram. I totally, ne I never thought about that. So I went to his Instagram feed and there it was his entire journey laid out in photographs and video clips everything he's been doing in africa all through ethiopia all through a whole bunch of different countries and he's i think the journey is almost over he's very near south africa and i think he projects he told someone that his journey is going to end in early april so his whole one year journey through Africa is over just about. Um, and it's all there on Instagram. But for whatever reason, he decided to just stockpile 
all the YouTube video. And when he's done the journey, then he's going to start editing it because it's just going to take him a long time to do it. So that's what's going on. So yesterday I went through his entire Instagram feed and that actually took a long time because again, planet Doug here, I had to read everything. So when he would post videos or photos, he actually wrote a fairly lengthy essay about each post and I would read the entire essay and every time he mentioned a place or a person or a thing or a plant or an animal, I would then do a Google search or a Google map search for that thing, place, person or animal. So it took me a long time to work through all of his posts and he wouldn't post just one photo. He would post 10 at a time and I would go to each photo and examine it carefully and then go to the next one and examine it. So it took me a long time to work through his entire Instagram feed and I found it all very interesting. Um, a lot of food for thought. Of course, I had a couple of typical Planet Doug trivia reactions. Let's get those out of the way first. The main one is that his overall style is not designed to appeal to me. And I think that is kind of a given. He's coming at his life and his experiences from a very energetic, inspiring sort of way. Everybody he meets is amazing. Everybody's a hero. Everybody's inspiring. Everybody is unbelievable. That's just the tone of everything he does and everything he sees. He's blown away. Everything is awesome. Everything is incredible. On and on and on. And me being a much more sedate, much more perhaps cynical sort of person, I can't really jive with all that optimism. Uh, it's not it's not my world I don't I don't live in that world where everything is so amazing all the time I would find that exhausting to be honest so there is that the tone of it is not my kind of tone and I'm pretty sure that when he does post the YouTube videos he plans to do it I won't really enjoy them from that point of view and of course there will be thousands of comments telling him that he's the most amazing and inspiring and incredible and awesome and everything's amazing and wonderful and inspiring and awesome and none of that will speak to me and all the other people that he meets on the road the local people other travelers other long distance cyclists everybody is living at this level of excitement and amazingness and awesomeness that uh, i can never hope to achieve. <laughs> I just don't have that sort of a mood in me, I suppose. So there is that. And the other really trivial, much more trivial reaction is, man, he looks terrible. I didn't realize, I didn't realize this, but I guess at the beginning of his trip, he made the commitment to not shave or cut his hair until the journey was over. He made that a kind of personal challenge. I'm embarking on this amazing journey of a lifetime through Africa, and I'm committed to not shaving or cutting my hair until I reach Cape Town. So he's turning that into a big symbolic part of his journey. I did, I, maybe I knew that when I watched his first videos, but it slipped my mind because I was wa looking at all of his Instagram posts and there were a lot of videos as well. And his beard just annoyed the heck out of me. All I wanted to do was jump on that guy, hold him down and, sh and cut it off and shave it off. You've got to get rid of that horrible looking beard and the hair. It was just too much. And I guess I had a, I have a personal connection with that because there have been a, several times two times at least in my life where my beard got out of control and I really wish somebody had taken me aside and said dude look in the mirror you got to get get that thing under control you got to get rid of it uh, <laughs> because at the time I guess I was 
lazy because not shaving is wonderful. You just grow a beard and you just let it grow and grow and grow and grow and you never have to worry about it. You never get your hair cut. You just turn into this wild child and it's a lot easier. You don't have to shave every day. And you also get into this mood of being a wild child. Um, you think it looks cool or something or it, it fits into your lifestyle. You're a rebel with your big, uh, big bushy beard and bushy hair or something. Anyway, now when I look at photographs from that time in my life, I, I just feel nothing but embarrassment. Why did I allow myself to look like that? I mentioned India earlier in this video when I went to India on a uh, cultural exchange. That's the first time it happened. And when I look at the, my photographs now of that time period, I'm just embarrassed because I look so unkempt and it felt very disrespectful in retrospect. I was living in a small village, a farming village in India with a local family, meeting all the local people. And I have these photographs of me with these people. And I have this huge Harley Davidson red biker beard. And I look so, to me, I look like I'm being disrespecting to the local people. I should have cleaned myself up and, and taken more pride in my appearance. But at the time, well, we were living in a life, a life without mirrors in the village where we were sleeping at night. There were no mirrors. You never really saw yourself. And this was before digital cameras. So it's not like you could take a selfie and then go, ooh. You never saw what you looked like until months later when you finally got the film developed. And then I saw the photographs and said, oh, why didn't somebody knock some sense into me? But anyway, Roberto Hello every single photo I'm looking at that beard and he's interacting with all the local people in Africa and all these villages. He's going to schools and giving presentations. He's going on media tours, giving interviews. And all the time I'm thinking, you really need to shave that thing off. It looks terrible. But apparently it was some sort of a personal symbolic part of his journey to look like that. But anyway. <laughs> That was my other uh, trivial reaction to his uh, Instagram feed. When it comes to people like Roberto and Patty Doyle or any of the YouTubers that I talk about, one of the reasons I focus so much on the tone of these videos, I, I don't know if this is obvious or not, but it's obvious to me. One of the reasons I react to it is because it is sometimes like a personal challenge where I see his journey through Africa and how amazing it is and how much he loves everything and how awesome it is and how inspiring it is and on and on and on. And then I feel like it's a bit of a challenge to me that I should be living like that, that I should be doing things in that way and I end up feeling inadequate by comparison, if you see what I mean. So that's one of the reasons I focus on it so much. And then I look for behind the scenes information where there's a clue that not everything is as rosy as it might seem on the surface. That maybe all this amazingness and inspiringness and awesomeness, maybe that's all social media illusion and the reality behind the scenes is not living up to that level. And he did make one recent post that gave a hint that this might be true. Um, it was a very unusual, very unusually honest post from him on uh, Instagram. And I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. So I'm quoting now. He says, I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm mentally exhausted. I have $612 left in my bank account and $250 in cash. I look tired and dirty most of the time. My beard and hair are horrendous and I get comments on it every day. 
but I promised myself not to cut or trim anything until I reach the final destination of this project. Sometimes I get bored from having the same small talk with so many strangers on the road. I'm also getting a bit jaded from seeing so many beautiful places and living crazy experiences all the time. I know it sounds privileged and ungrateful. So that's a very interesting insight to his mood and even the physical conditions where when I was looking at his Instagram feed, I was thinking of, again about where's all the money coming from because he was doing things that I know cost hundreds of dollars going on seven day tricks, tricks, seven day treks into the Ruanzori mountains with a guide and porters and you know, these things, you know, these things cost hundreds of dollars and again, I'm wondering where the money is coming from, but he says here, he's got nothing left in the bank and he's got $250 in cash and now he's getting to the end of his journey and does he even have enough money to get home again, to fly from Cape, Cape Town back to, uh, back to Lebanon or whatever. And he points out some of the things that he's tired and jaded about all these experiences, but it is very much in stark contrast to the tone of his normal posts, where here is this experience that's mind-blowingly awesome, but maybe in the background he's stressing, about, stressing out about so many things and he's kind of bored with it all because he's doing all these amazing things, but uh, you know, I think I start saying, you know, when I don't really know what it is I'm trying to say. I'm struggling with the words and then I start saying, you know. So I guess I'm not really clear on what it is I'm trying to say here, but maybe I can use an example that will bring this down to earth because I went to Ethiopia myself many, many years ago and I was mainly interested in his experiences in Ethiopia because for me, Ethiopia was mind-blowing. It is a very special country and I don't throw around terms like that lightly. In social media, it seems like every country that a YouTuber goes to, it's amazing and it's incredible and the people are so friendly. There are so many superlatives. I don't tend to do that. If I say something, it's because I really mean it. And Ethiopia is special as a country. So I'm very interested in what he experiences in Ethiopia and his Instagram feed is no disappointment. He shows so many sides of Ethiopia that are extraordinary, very, very interesting. And he also went into the Simeon Mountains the Simeon Mountains are part of this plateau. Ethiopia actually has a very high mountainous plateau in the north of the country. People don't think of Africa like that. They think of Africa as being savanna and lowlands, but northern Ethiopia is very mountainous and starts on a very high plateau. And then you get the Simeon Mountains on top of that spectacular region really beautiful, really interesting. And there is the Simeon Mountains Park. And as a foreigner, or anyone can go there and go for a trek through the Simeon Mountains, multiple day treks, and you have to hire a local guide and you have to hire a local armed scout to go with you. It's a whole thing. You've got to get permits to go into the park. He did it and I did it as well. He went to he did the biggest thing. There's a mountain there, the highest mountain in Ethiopia, and he signed up for a trek that would take him to summit the highest mountain. I didn't do that. I went for the basic trek through the Simeon Mountains Park. So it's different from that point of view. But when I read through his posts and watch all his videos, it sounds extraordinary. He had the most amazing, inspiring, incredible time. Everything is wonderful. Everything is over the top, astonishingly good. 
And then, of course, I'm, I'm looking at all of that and I'm feeling a little bit inadequate by comparison because my experience wasn't like that at all. It was good and there were things that I appreciated about it, mainly the beauty of the scenery and how unusual that those mountains look. It's a very special kind of place. But if you ask me about my experience, if I were going to talk about it, post photos about it, and tell you the story, I'm not going to be able to come up with the Roberto version because that, for me, it wouldn't be honest. And I do wonder whether he also had these experiences, but in telling the story on social media, he just ignores all of that and puts it in the background because nobody wants to hear about that stuff. People want to hear about how wonderful it was. People want to live an amazing experience vicariously through you. They don't want to live through all the problems. But anyway, he talked about his guide for one thing, and his guide was amazing and full of information. And he talks about how he would stay up all night long having these deep conversations where they're talking about important things and comparing things and learning about life and on and on and on. And I remember, like, I'll tell just a little bit of my experience to get the contrast. I was in that part of Ethiopia. And to be honest, I wasn't even going to do the Simeon, Mount, Simeon Mountains trek because those sorts of things don't tend to work out for me. But I thought, okay, I'm here. We might as well try to do it. And I was bike touring. I had a bicycle with me. And then I ended up looking for a guide. You have to get a guide who organizes everything for you. And you pay them. And you pay them to handle everything. So they have to get a scout. They pay the scout with the gun to come with you. You have to get porters with mules and donkeys because they go with you. And they, they carry all the tents and the gear and the sleeping bags and the food and the water, things like that. So they go on ahead of you, set up camp, and then you go trekking for the day. And then you arrive in camp and you have a cook and a porter and they've already prepared the meals for you. That, that's how it works. So I found, I went through all the hassle of trying to find a guide. Again, this was before the days of the internet, so you couldn't go on YouTube and, or go on a website and get recommendations. You just had to go out looking. And I found a guy, he seemed like a good guide, and I arranged things with him. And then my relationship with that guide was just unpleasant from beginning to end because he just kept hounding me for more and more and more money constantly more money things are going to cost more you got to pay for this you got to pay for this and it was just an endless hassle to deal with the guy and things were always out of control he was not communicating properly he was not giving good information the logistics were out of control it was just a stressful frustrating nitpicking experience where the guy was just constantly asking for more money and demanding more money and it just became so annoying over time and it became even worse for me because in order to afford the experience I had to find other people to go with me so I went out looking for other backpackers to find someone oh do you want to do a Simeon Mountains trek let's do it together so that we can split the cost. And again, I don't normally do that because I don't like being in charge of other people's experiences. I'm much more comfortable in the role of a either completely independent person with no connection to anybody, or I want to be a follower because I don't really care that much about stuff. Other people have a lot of opinions about things. So whoever has the most opinions, I'll let them be the leader and I will help in the background. I'm, I'm more comfortable as a follower than a leader. Because if I'm the leader, I feel the weight of leadership too much. I feel responsible for the people that I'm leading. And in this case, I was the one organizing the trek. 
I was the one getting the guide and making the arrangements and then I was finding people to join me and I found these two guys from the UK who were willing to join me but then when everything to do with the logistics and the cost started to spin out of control the two guys from the UK were very unhappy and were complaining to me about how much everything was starting to cost and it was too expensive and this wasn't working and this wasn't working and now I was caught in the middle between these two guys and my guide and it just went on and on and on and the whole thing from beginning to end was simply unpleasant because of all this behind the scenes hassle about money basically money and logistics and organization where i couldn't get any information about that fr out of this guy we didn't know when we were going or where we would go or when we were leaving how we could do this and then it's not like we were staying up late at night and exchanging deep philosophical ideas about culture and the meaning of life none of that was going on either so yeah um I do end up wondering how much of that is actually happening in one of these social media stories that the person is just not telling you about. So hopefully that uh, makes, uh, maybe that makes a little bit of context for how I'm approaching you know, his story of the uh, Simeon Mountains. My memory of that experience is very, very strong on the positive side. The scenery there is unbelievable, really spectacular, and I would recommend it to anybody. I would say, if you're going to Ethiopia, you have to go to the Simeon Mountains. It's a must. And again, I don't throw that around lightly. I don't often say that something is a must, but this absolutely is a must. You should do it because of the scenery and the unusual landscapes Everything about it is so fascinating and interesting. So I do have those memories and I would say that, but the effort of setting it up and dealing with the people was just exhausting. It really, really was. So yeah, there's that. I think I have only one item to talk about in a pop culture roundup and that is um, a new TV series that I may or may not continue watching. I'm not sure. I'm a sucker for a certain type of spectacle, I suppose. I do like good movies. I like, I guess, what people would call an independent film, an art film. Movies don't have to have monsters and explosions to keep my attention but i do enjoy a good monster movie as well or a monster tv show i can i can go both directions is what i'm saying and this show is called i believe monarch legacy of monsters and it is a tv show that's part of the king kong godzilla universe and when i saw a trailer for it kind of piqued my interest. I thought, wow, well, that actually looks better than I expected. When I first heard about it, I just dismissed it. I didn't think it could be of any interest to me at all. The whole world of Godzilla and King Kong, especially when you put them in the same universe, has so many logical problems to it, things that don't make any sense at all that it's a very difficult watch for me. In order for you to show me a Godzilla or King Kong movie and have me enjoy it, you really have to toe the line in terms of making it believable for me, where I don't just constantly roll my eyes and think, God, give me a break. That's the most stupid thing I've ever seen. But when I watched the trailer, I thought, huh, there's something there, there's something there that maybe I can get into. So I watched the first episode and there were things in the first episode that really bothered me, but there was enough in the first episode that I went, huh, you know, there might be something here. So I sort of stuck with it 
and I believe I've watched three, maybe four episodes. I'm not quite sure. I think there's 10 episodes in total in the first season. But now that I've gotten this far into the show, ugh, it is a slog. It's hard to watch, and I can't recommend it. I really can't. I may stick with it a little bit longer just because of the things that I do like. But one thing they're doing is they have different time periods. So they have a time period in the past. That I'm kind of enjoying. And then they have a modern day time period. And that's the part I'm having trouble with because the characters are so annoying. I don't understand how you can write a TV show and put a show together where the main characters are so bratty, so annoying, whining and whining and whining about everything all the time. I can't handle these people. There's a, it's set mainly in Japan at the beginning. I guess there's someone from the United States. She's, of, she's American, but she is of Japanese descent. And then she flies to Japan and meets up with some other people there and they are Japanese and then I guess there's an expat maybe she's American as well but an American expat living in Japan and these three young people are interacting all the time and they are so annoying they're so annoying that I needed people to vent to or to hear other people say the same thing. So I was going in onto Google and typing in monarchy, legacy of monsters. Characters are so annoying. And I would do Google searches just like that because I needed to find the Reddit thread where people are talking about this TV show and telling each other about how annoying these characters are because they were so annoying I needed to get it out of my system and I went looking for threads online where people were just talking back and forth back and forth about how annoying these characters are and how much they hate them and how much they wish they would just shut up and I was like yes 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 I was looking for affirmation of my reaction to these people so that was kind of funny but uh, the rest of the show the monster side of it so far is, is better than I expected. There's stuff going on and they're dancing around the problems because there are scientific problems, there's logic problems, things that are just stupid. And everybody knows they're stupid and they're not logical, but they're gonna make the TV show anyway and they just have to somehow dance around all of this stuff and keep you engaged in the story anyway. And they're doing a pretty good job with that and I'm sort of enjoying that. And one way I find that they're getting away with all this dumb stuff is that they're investing in this idea that these monsters, these titans, it's like they come from an alternate reality. They come from another universe almost. And you saw that in the original Kong versus Godzilla movies where when the humans traveled to the world of the Titans, they actually went through a kind of wormhole. And who knows where the wormhole takes them. In theory, it's like they were going to the center of the Earth. And in the center of the Earth, that's where King Kong came from. That's where these massive monsters all live in the center of the, of the earth. But they also put in this idea that they went through some kind of a, a wormhole that takes them through time and space. And you could be ending up in another reality altogether. And then these Titans make no sense in our world, but you can still accept them because maybe these Titans came through a, 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 an opening a break between the alternate reality and our reality and they come through this almost like coming through a, a portal basically from another dimension and they end up here and they're here for a little while causing havoc and then maybe when they're done 
when, maybe when Godzilla is done stomping on Tokyo and destroying all these cities and fighting King Kong or joining up with King Kong to fight another monster, whatever it is they're doing, then they can all kind of fade into the background and you can say, well, they're going back to their own reality now. And the reason you don't see Godzilla's everywhere in the ocean is because they're not actually there. They've gone back to their own dimension now or something like that. They're dancing around all of these ideas. And if I'm looking at that from a point of view of a script writer or somebody, I'm thinking, okay, I'll give you that. Okay, I'll watch your TV show and I'll accept that idea. So when this huge monster shows up that makes no sense in our world, I can let it go. So I'm hanging in there with the monster story. But the humans, boy, oh boy, so annoying. <laughs> I can't wait for some monster to stomp on them and we can get some new characters because these ones are just too much for me to handle. Kurt Russell is in it. He's good. Kurt Russell is amazing. He's great. And in fact, one of the younger characters in the other time period, he's Kurt Russell as a young man. So you get Kurt Russell as a young guy and then as an older guy. And they, they work fine, but uh, the characters around them can be a super, super annoying at times. So, Monarchy leg Legacy of Monsters. Do I recommend it? No. But if you're really into Godzilla and King Kong and stuff like that, eh, might be a, might be worth a look if if you have some time on your hands. My camera battery and my throat are both uh, wearing out, so I have to wind this up pretty quick this morning. But uh, very quickly, just to get it out of my system, a couple of pet peeves. I mentioned one already. Spoiler alert. There's a difference between a spoiler and a spoiler alert. You got to get that right if you're into precision in language. Another one that has been bothering me lately is melting pot. Because so many YouTubers go to a country that is filled with cultural stuff temples and artwork and dances and music and when they want to talk about how wonderful it is they always call it a melting pot of different cultures people go around thailand and they describe it as a melting pot or anywhere they go that has tons and tons of a whole variety of culture they call it a melting pot but that is exactly wrong because a melting pot is a place where people from different cultures come and they leave their culture behind and they become part of that culture. So I always grew up with this idea in Canada, if we're trying to feel good about ourselves, we talk about the United States and we'll say that the United States is a melting pot because people come from all around the world, they immigrate to the United States and they become American. Everybody becomes an American and their culture melts away and it all becomes one culture, the American culture. Canada, we would say, is different. We are a cultural mosaic where immigrants come from all over the world and then they retain their culture. So if someone comes from India, lives in Canada, they don't become the same as all other Canadians. They remain part of their own culture if they want to. So that's the idea between a melting pot where people just melt into one and a cultural mosaic. So everybody who goes to another country, if they go to Malaysia and they call it a melting pot of different cultures because there's the Chinese community, the Indian community, the Malay community and on and on. No, that isn't a melting pot. That is a cultural mosaic. If it was a melting pot, they all would have become one culture, if you see what I mean. It, it would be like putting different color paint, red, yellow, and blue, into the same pot, and you stir it, you, it's not red, yellow, or blue anymore. It all merges and becomes a different con color. Or you put different metals together. You put copper and aluminum and gold, put it all into one pot and heat it, and it all melts. That is a melting pot. And all that metal 
just fuses together into a new metal. That's a melting pot. If you want to talk about how there's so much variation in the culture, so many different cultures, you could call that a mosaic or something like that, but it's not a melting pot. So, Planet Doug Pet Peeve. Another one, I think I've talked about it before, but it's annoying me today more than normal, mainly because of um, Roberto, when I watched all of his Instagram stuff, he called everything most unique, very unique, extremely unique, and all of that is incorrect if you want to speak with precision. Unique can't be modified. Something either is unique or it isn't unique because it means one of a kind. So you cannot say it is very unique. He, Roberto, goes to Africa, goes to a new country, landscape, food, culture, whatever it is, and he would constantly say, this is the most unique place I've ever seen. They have, the, they have very unique food. No, they either have unique food or they don't. There's no such thing as very unique, extremely unique, most unique. None of that is good English. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> of course, I was talking about this with a friend of mine recently, and I did admit that around the world, in common English usage, everybody says most unique all the time. It's so common that most people think it is correct now. And if most people think it is correct, then of course there is a time when it does become correct because language evolves over time, it changes. There was a time when most unique was incorrect. I come from that time. Maybe we've moved into a, a, a history, a time period, when now most unique is acceptable English. For me, in grammar books, in dictionaries, no, it is not acceptable, but I do admit that languages evolve and you can't fight it, you can't stop language from changing, so I'm not going to go too crazy about it, but just as I don't ever want to say, you know, I definitely never want to say most unique or very unique because it is not, uh, not correct English, technically speaking. So that is it. Uh, I believe I am winding down now. Time to uh, shut down my camera. I'm hoping to shut it down right before the battery dies. <laughs> we'll see if I get it. And uh, it's lunchtime. There's a little restaurant right beside my hotel, an economy rice place. And I'm going to go there and uh, have my lunch. It's noon right now, 12 o'clock exactly. And I usually like to wait until after the lunch rush to have my lunch. but. Uh, I think it'll be okay. I'll go there and uh, get in there with the crowds and hopefully there's a table free for me to sit down. If not, I guess I can get it to go or something like that. So that's it. Thank you for hanging out with me on uh, Planet Doug Behind the Scenes and I'll see you in the next video.